This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Also, make sure to check out and subscribe to our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, available only on YouTube. So, uh, what do you all think of Back to the Future? <laughs> That's pretty awesome. Uh, before, before we start, uh, we have to, I have to tell you something. Um, the Poly Theater interns are the best group of interns I've ever had. They only ha they are the ones who completely wrote, produced, and directed this event. And they did it in two weeks. So we're very, very, Carsey Wolf Center Film Media Studies Department is very, very proud of the Poly Theater interns for throwing this event together. And I wasn't even available because I was in New York out of town for a while and they really picked up the slack and ran this whole entire thing. So let's give a uh, shout out to all the Poly Theater interns. Okay. All right, so let me introduce our guest. Our first guest, uh, Bob Gale, wrote the classic screenplay for I Want to Hold Your Hand. 1941, starring John Belushi, and a little-known TV series called Night Stalker, which none of you know anything about, but rest assured you will, because Johnny Depp's doing the remake. And of course, he did something called, uh, I think, Back to the Future trilogy. So let me introduce our guest, Mr. Bob Gale. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. And parts two and three. Let's and two and three, of course. <laughs> Let's see Our next guest uh, played the evilest, creepiest tune ever in Who Framed Roger Rabbit. <laughs> Uncle Fester in Adam's Family. Reverend Jim on Taxi. <laughs> All right, got a few left. And those weren't enough iconic cameras. He, of course, played Dr. Emmett Brown. Please welcome to the public stage, Christopher Lloyd. Thank you. <laughs> well, uh, what was it? <laughs> so, Chris, uh, what was it like seeing Back to the Future again here at the Poly Theater? Well, I tell you, um, I was stunned. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you, you, you make a film, and you, while you're making it, you're concerned whether it's going to work or not, <laughs> whether the work you're doing is good, and all these things, you know. And just looking at it now, and it, you know, there's so many people make their own contributions, uh, makeup people, or costume, or, uh, camera, you know, everybody, you know. But I've never appreciated as much before, as much as I did tonight. What an incredible writing job you did. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's just <laughs> so amazing, just amazing. <laughs> How was for you, Bob, seeing it, you know, tonight at 26 years? Well, I've, I've seen it more recently than 1985. <laughs> <laughs> really, I have. Um, but I haven't seen it with an audience in a really long time. And I love coming to see it with an audience. I mean, after at, there's a certain point in a filmmaker's... Uh, after you've made a movie, you can't stand to look at it because all you do is you see the mistakes. But enough time has gone by now that I don't care about that anymore. And uh, the energy that uh, the energy that any great movie gets from a receptive audience, um, you know, this is why it's not always a good idea to wait for the DVD. <laughs> <laughs> Um, if you notice, our audience is filled with at least two-thirds people who have not even born when Back to the Future is made. <laughs> so, so, Bob, why do you think this film is able to transcend the stands of time without a flux capacitor? <laughs> <laughs> um, 
when the movie came out, it was a gigantic hit all around the world. And there's the moment that every human being has in their life when they're seven, eight, nine, ten years old, when you finally actually understand the concept that your parents were actually once children. It's a <laughs> mind-boggling moment. Um, we take it for granted so much, but there's some, you, you know, you hear all your life when you're a little kid, yeah, well, when I was your age, I didn't do that, you know? Um, wait till you grow up to be my age, and you're, these are concepts that don't make any sense when you're five or six years old. How can somebody that big have been somebody this little? Uh, but at a certain point, it clicks, and you say, yikes, wow, they once were little kids. And it was some amazing moment. Um, it, it was, I, I've told the story many times, the, the germ of this idea, Back to the Future, came about when I uh, discovered my father's high school yearbook. My father had attended the same high school that I attended. And my father was the, graduate, was the president of his graduating class. And I'm looking at this picture of my father looking very straight and, you know, the, like the class president. And I'm thinking about the guy who was the president of my class who was an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm saying, geez, was my dad an asshole like the president <laughs> of my senior class? Is that the type of guy he was? Because, you know, there's cliches, and cliches are cliches because they're true. And the guys that want to be president, whether it's the president of your class or the president of the United States, they're always assholes, right? <laughs> so I wondered whether or not I would be, I'd been friends with my dad if I had gone to high school with him. And that was, that was the germ of the idea. So uh, it connects with this very human thing that everybody has. It doesn't matter when you were born, you come to the realization that your parents were once kids and nobody had ever really made a movie about it. And when I came back to California and told Bob Zemeckis about this idea. He got all excited about it, and he said, yeah, what if it turned out that your mom was like the school slut? And <laughs> we just started cooking on this idea, and uh, there we are. <laughs> so, so, Chris, why do you think Dr. Brown is, he's, he's a beloved character. What do you think is one of the reasons people still latch on to him so deeply? Uh, so Doc, my God, Doc is like a, almost like a cliche, <laughs> you know. He's he's this. You can call him a madman, but his imagination never stops. Um, Sometimes, you know, he, he, uh, I remember him reading about a scientist who was working on some very intricate problem in physics, uh, and he'd been working on it for maybe years. And, and one day, he's getting on a bus. And he thinks of it. He, 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 the solution suddenly comes to him. So Doc Brown falls down and hits his head on the edge of a toilet, and bingo, he, he figures out the flux capacitor. That sort of um, that sort of thing just always amazed me, and it still does. Um, so, and also I think Doc Brown. Um, kids, going back to kids again, there are s certain people when I grew up, only about two or three of them who were like mentors. They were people that I looked up to and thought, my God, these people are so exciting. They understand things. I'm, I'm coming to know more through them. And I think that's what Doc, Doc and Marty, kind of the essence of the Doc-Marty uh, relationship. I mean, uh, Doc is like this incredible human being that Marty is seeing doing these amazing things, and it's like awesome, you know. <laughs> uh, so I don't know if that may answer your question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so Bob, what were some of the challenges of bringing Back to the Future this from script to screen? <coughs> well, for any of you who are uh, aspiring writers, uh, you should know that um, Back to the Future was rejected, the script was rejected over 40 times. Um, 
you have to be crazy to want to be in the film business, uh, and you have to be able to take a lot of rejection because, uh, as uh, screenwriter William Goldman said, nobody knows anything. We were told over and over again, oh, it's a time travel movie. Time travel never makes any money. We heard that one, and then we heard, um, it's very nice, it's very sweet. We wrote this in, uh, the first draft was dated 1981. Um, there were movies coming out like Stripes, Porky's, um, you know, the raunchier er comedies of the early 80s. And ours was nice and sweet, and uh, nobody's gonna wanna see a movie that's nice and sweet. And, and we were told over and over again, why don't you guys take this to Disney? This could be a Disney movie. And this was, this was when Disney was a complete mess um, before Michael Eisner had come in and the company was being run by the last vestiges of, of uh, the Walt Disney family uh, and they were making wonderful movies like The Black Hole. <laughs> <laughs> so finally Zemeckis and I said, well, what the hell, we got nothing to lose, let's go, let's go take it to Disney and see what they say. Um, so we go into this executive's office and he looks at us and he said, are you guys insane? We can't make a movie like this. You've got the kid and his mother in the car. It's incest and we're Disney. We do family movies here. <laughs> so um, uh, the challenge was getting it made and I must say Zemeckis and I have talked about this many times. We don't know if we could get the movie made today, actually, because the mashup of genres that, uh, that make this movie so fresh and exciting and crazy and exuberant, I mean, they don't know where to put this movie in the video store, you know? Is it family? Is it comedy? Is it science fiction? Is it adventure? It's all that stuff. Um, and it all works, but today, they want everything to be just one thing. They get, the, the studios get real nervous when you take some chances and you do something crazy. So I, I don't even know if we could have made the movie, uh, it was the right movie at the right time. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, what was the challenge? What, how did you come on board or how did you come into the park? I got a call. <laughs> <laughs> I got a call and, oh, I, I actually it's a little more complicated. I was in uh, Mexico, Mexico City. And um, first, we, you should know we sent Chris the script because Chris had been a movie called *The Adventures of Buckaroo Banzai*, yeah. and Neil right. Canton, who was a co-producer uh, on *Back to the Future*, had worked on *Buckaroo Banzai* and knew Chris from there. And Neil was the one that said, "Chris Lloyd, we got to send the script to Chris Lloyd." Okay, cool. I didn't know that. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> That's why we keep coming to these things. You always learn something new. So. Uh, yeah, it was a little bit strange because I, I was uh, in Mexico doing this film there and I got a, an offer to go back to the theater. I, I moved out to New York to, and there was always this kind of thing that, you know, the theater was my home, my roots, so to speak, and my conscience was bothering me a little bit that I was <laughs> coming out to Hollywood and, sell, you know, selling my soul <laughs> to the devil. And so I was doing this film, and I got an offer to go back to New York and do a film with Colleen Dewhurst, Hans Christian Andersen. I was going to be Hans Christian Andersen. <laughs> and I was, I thought, this is what I'm going to do. This is what i got to do. i got to get out of this kind of world that seems very kind of nebulous and insecure and go back and do the theater. And the script came. And my agent, Bob, uh, said, read the script, come back and meet Bob Zemeckis. And I didn't know, I didn't know who Bob Zemeckis was. And I kind of looked at the script and I decided, no, I'm going back to New York. And <laughs> I know the story. Don't Sorry. be mad. <laughs> I'm not mad. I, I, you told me this. I took the script and I put it in the wastepaper I basket. <laughs> I know that. Yeah, and a friend of mine said that one of my uh, models was that I, I never leave a stone unturned, that I check everything out, which is a good idea if you're going to be in this business because you never know. So I decided I'd go back, I'd meet Bob <laughs> Zemeckis, and I met Bob Zemeckis, that was that. 
Uh, I was convinced. <laughs> and in New York, the play opened and got panned. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so, Bob, you ran into a slight problem where you decided to change the casting of Marty after a few weeks of shooting with a different actor before Michael came on. How, what was the challenge of that from a producer and actually from rewriting the character when Michael uh, popped on board? We uh, originally cast Eric Stoltz in the part of Marty McFly. Uh, we wanted Michael J. Fox, but Michael was doing his TV series Family Ties and uh, Gary Goldberg, the producer of Family Ties, we approached Gary about uh, if we could get Michael to be in this movie, and Gary said, absolutely not. Uh, Michael's TV schedule is too full. Uh, I, I won't allow it. I don't even want to let him read the script. <laughs> Gary re had read the script, and he loved it. He said, if, if I let Michael read the script and tell him that he can't do the movie, Michael's going to hate me for the rest of, rest of, uh, the rest of his life. So... Um, we didn't go there because we couldn't. And uh, um, we ended up casting uh, Eric Stoltz. Um, he was the favorite choice of, uh, of uh, Sidney Scheinberg, who was the CEO of Universal, and was a big fan of a movie that Eric did called Mask, very good picture, and was convinced that Eric could do comedy. We shot for five weeks, and we became convinced that Eric really wasn't very good at comedy. <laughs> and um, uh, we were editing the movie as we went along. And uh, Bob Zemeckis came to me and he said, Bob, you need to look at this footage. I think we got a problem. And right there, I knew there was a problem because Bob and I, when, when we did all our movies together, I never saw anything cut together until there was an entire cut of the whole movie. And that way, Bob had somebody he could completely trust to look at the picture from beginning to end without looking at it piecemeal. So the fact that Bob wanted me to see uh, what he cut, okay, well, there's a problem. And yeah, there was a problem. And uh, uh, we showed the footage to uh, uh, Steven Spielberg and Frank Marshall and Kathy Kennedy, and of course, Neil Canton, uh, my co-producer. We all agreed that uh, we had a problem. And uh, Stephen, uh, in his wisdom, said, um, you can't, we can't go to Scheinberg and tell him we've got a problem without having a solution for the problem. So let's, see, let's figure out who else can be in the movie before we tell him that we want to fire Eric. Don't say we want to fire Eric and shut down. Say we want to fire Eric and hire maybe Michael J. Fox. So we went back to Gary Goldberg on bended knee. Uh, this was now many weeks later from when we, he'd been, he turned us down. Family Ties was further along in its schedule. We said we are, you know, really up Shit's Creek without a paddle. Michael is the guy. And Gary knew Michael was the perfect choice. And he said, if you guys will agree to shoot your movie around our television schedule, I'll let Michael read the script. And if he wants to do it, um, okay. Michael read the script. He loved the script. Uh, he said, I'm 21 years old. I don't need sleep. What the hell do I need sleep for? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and he came right, he came right on. Um, as far as changing the script, because Michael was in it, we didn't change anything. No. We cast the part of Marty. Now, um, Chris will talk about this in a minute, I know, because... <laughs> Chris is a theater-trained actor. A theater-trained actor learns the entire script. First day of shooting, Chris knew the entire script. Michael J. Fox, television-trained actor. And on a sitcom particularly, the writers are always changing. They rehearse it, they change the script. They rehearse it the next day, they change the script. So Michael never learned his lines, because what was the point of learning his lines? They're going to change them tomorrow. So he learned his lines 10 minutes before he had to say them. And so there was a real interesting dynamic between how Michael and Chris worked, because Chris had everything worked out, and Michael would throw in these ad libs, uh, and they were wonderful. I mean, he totally, he brought so much to the character of Marty McFly. Um, uh, you know, 
near the end there, he, he looks over, flux capacitor, fluxing. I mean, that just, Michael just <laughs> did that. You know, <laughs> wow, rock and roll at the, at the beginning. That, that wasn't the scripted line. He just did that, and it was better than what we wrote. So, um, oh, I know he would throw you off sometimes, <laughs> Chris. Yeah, I was, I was a little nervous about the whole situation. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, first of all, it was like I, I had no idea that a change was going to be made. Um, uh, uh, what's his name? Who? Uh, the other actor. Eric Stoltz. <laughs> Eric Stoltz. <laughs> Eric Stoltz. <laughs> yes. Um, I Eric, mean, just, he, Eric did it exactly uh, as written. Yeah. He didn't Eric, remember. Eric was, is a very good actor, and, and I felt that the rapport between us was working. But as um, Bob says, the, the comedic value was lacking. So at night, five, six weeks into the shoot, it was around one o'clock in the morning, we broke for dinner. And then it was in the in the in the uh, in mall the, in, the, in the mall parking lot at uh, Puente Hills Mall. Yeah, uh, and uh, we were asked to all come together outside. That announcement was going to be made, and Steven Spielberg was there, and the other suits or whatever. And it was announced that Eric Stoltz was leaving, and it was like a wake. It was not a, a cheerful, joyful moment. <laughs> yeah. But my biggest concern, um, I felt that I had, I had really given 100% to do what I'd done with Eric Stoltz as well as I could. And my terror was, now we're going to have to do it again. And am I going to be able to live up to the first take, <laughs> so to speak? So, but it worked out. My, Michael brought such a wonderful energy. Uh, you know, and e ease and fun to it. That he made he made everybody better. It was it was yeah. really interesting to see the scenes that that we redid. Um, that, that that everybody who was around Michael fed off of Michael's energy, and the energy level went way up. It was it was just amazing. Yeah. So, um, I mean, uh, Michael's a great actor. You're a great actor. The great screenplay. But there's a certain chemistry you two had that was apparent in the, all three of the films. Mm -hmm. how, how does that work? Sometimes you just connect with an actor in some way, or is it yeah, just I, magic? It, I don't think it's anything we planned or talked about. It was just in, innate, you know, it was just there. And um, it was just an energy between the two of us that existed. It was always, uh, we never had to work for it, I don't think, or worry about it. It, it was... It, it we call it lightning in a bottle, you know. It's, yeah. You know, why, kind of. why are you attracted to that person? You look at him across the room, and there, there's, you know, chemistry, lightning. Um, yeah. you know, and of course, I have to use lightning as the metaphor on this picture. <laughs> <laughs> so when you're writing, Bob, how did you capitalize that in Back to the Future 2 and 3? Did you notice that after Back to the Future 1, wow, these two have something together and can kind of run with it a little? Yeah, it helps, it helps a lot uh, as a writer to know the actors who are going to be speaking the dialogue. And with Chris, knowing that he could memorize all this paragraphs of scientific mumbo jumbo, <laughs> um, and the, the Piece um, of cake. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, the, the, rule that, the rule that I had for, for writing uh, Doc Brown's dialogue was, uh, Doc never used a small word when a big word would do, um, which is why a dance is a rhythmic ceremonial ritual. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, knowing, knowing that it was Chris uh, and knowing that it was Michael and knowing Tom Wilson, knowing what, what the actors could do, that, that helps you. I, I mean, a trick that I use as a screenwriter um, is I imagine a great actor um, or, or even just somebody I know who has a particular speech pattern saying, saying the dialogue, being the character, even if, even if they're dead. Um, you know, Jimmy Stewart has a particular way of talking. Humphrey Bogart has a particular way of talking. Katherine Hepburn has a particular way of talking. These are movie stars who I've seen all their movies so many times that their voices are in my head. Then, and so if I listen to have their voice in my head as I'm writing the dialogue, the dialogue comes out a, a, a certain way, 
and great dialogue. Um, you should be able to read the dialogue and not have to, not have to see which character is speaking it. it. You should be able to just, oh yeah, that's, that's obviously a Doc Brown line. So um, again, having the, having the cast already figured out, big help to writing. So, so Christopher, back to the future three, what was most appealing? Going back to the Old West, working with Michael again, or kissing Mary Steenberger? <laughs> Did I kiss Mary Yeah, it was a year. I guess it was a little strange. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's the only one I've ever had on screen, so I Which, treasure Yeah, it was Chris's yeah. first screen kiss. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I love three. When people ask me which one I liked the best because it was a western, horseback riding, working on that steam engine. I don't know if any of you have had the opportunity to get up on a steam engine when it's operating. It's an, uh, it's an awesome machine. <laughs> and, and to be riding, horseback riding, and a western, and just great, great scenes and locations, and the romance, you know. Doc has his romance, and that was a lot of fun. <laughs> 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 so, um, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, uh, so uh, at the Back to the Future one, did you have a trilogy in mind? Did you have sequels in mind, or no? No, no people. That's that's. Um, there's there's a, there's a few. There's one misconception. People think that, um, that to be continued that was on the uh, Back to the Future VHS edition was uh, in the theater. It was not. This is exactly the way it was in the theater. When we wrote this movie, I mean, after having it rejected 40-odd times, the idea that we were going to do another one was not even in our consciousness. Um, the heroes get on their horse and ride off into the sunset for another adventure. That's a classic heroic ending for any movie, and that's what we had in mind. They get into the DeLorean and they go off to have another adventure. As Bob Zemeckis has stated many times, if we knew we were going to do part two, we would have never put Jennifer in the car. Because uh, um, when we got around to writing part two, we said, what are we going to do with Jennifer? Uh, I'm not going to talk too much about that because this is about part one, and there's people here that hadn't ever seen part one, so I know they haven't seen part two, <laughs> and I'm going to be the last person to be a spoiler for my own movies. <laughs> That's not happening. So, um, <laughs> and what, what you have here are two different scenes that are that have that have been butted up against each other for this. Don't get the wrong impression that these scenes were ever at one point right next to each other. Absolutely not the case. So, and I'm going to ask Sarah Callahan, one of my wonderful students uh, who works with me, is going to help us read. She's going to read the stage direction, which was wonderful. So thank you, Sarah, for joining us. <laughs> so, uh. Consoles. Hands twist rheostats. Needles on gauges jump to life. A hand poses in readiness over a set of guitar strings about to play. Fingers turn a calibrated knob from three to 10. We see a high school aged kid, we can't see his face, ready to play his electric guitar. It's connected through a battery of amplifying equipment into a huge speaker 10 feet tall. The kid hits it and there is a tremendous explosion from the speaker which literally blasts the kid off his feet and into a set of shelves which collapse, covering him with books, tools, and junk. The blown speaker smokes on the rubble. The stunned kid regains his sen senses and looks around. He's Marty McFly, 17, dressed in jeans and a jean jacket. Whoa, now that's what I call music. As Marty picks himself up, a huge alarm bell on the wall clangs. Marty runs over to the phone and answers it. Yo. Marty, th thank God I found you there. Doc, Doc, where have you been all week? Uh, uh, never mind that now. Listen, can you meet me at Twin Pines Mall tonight at 1.15? 1 1.15 1 in the morning? Uh, right. I've made a major breakthrough and I'll need your assistance. Uh, uh, okay, Doc, but... W w What's going on? I'll give you all the details at the appropriate time. Don't forget now. 
tomorrow morning, 1.50 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, Doc, uh, yeah, about your amplifier. Oh, 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 that's right. Whatever you do, don't use the, that amp. There's a slight possibility of overload. I, I was just thinking that. Suddenly, all of the clocks strike 8 o'clock at once. Chimes, cuckoos, and digital beeps all toll in a bizarre cacophony. Are those my clocks I hear? Yup, it's 8 o'clock. Perfect. My experiment worked. They're all exactly 25 minutes slow. Uh, wait, wait, 25 minutes slow? Are, are you telling me it's almost 8.30? Precisely. Damn, I'm late for school. <laughs> Marty hangs up. He puts his Walkman headphones on, grabs his backpack, and reaches down to retrieve his skateboard. Once again, we see the plutonium case, but Marty doesn't. The rear truck doors suddenly open, and a sleek stainless steel DeLorean drives down the drop-down gate onto the parking lot. It's been modified with coils and some wicked-looking units on the rear engine. Marty stares at it in amazement. The DeLorean pulls up to him and stops. The gullwing driver's door opens up and out steps Dr. Emmett Brown, 65. He's clad in a white radiation suit, hood off. His hair is wild and his eyes are full of life and energy. Good evening, Marty. Welcome to my latest experiment. This is the big one, the one I've been waiting for all my life. Marty ogles the vehicle. It it's a DeLorean, but what'd you do to it? And what's with that deep uh, suit? Bear with me, Marty. All of your questions will be answered. Roll tape, and we'll proceed. Marty raises the camera. Brown clears his throat and addresses the camera. Good evening. I'm Dr. Emmett Brown. I'm standing here on the parking lot at Twin Pines Mall. It's Saturday morning, October 26, 1985, 1.19 a.m. And this is temporal experiment number one. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Einstein. Get in, boy. The dog <laughs> obediently jumps in and sits in the driver's seat. Brown buckles him in with the shoulder harness. Please note that Einstein's clock here is in precise synchronization with my control watch. Brown holds up the digital watch <laughs> next to Einstein's clock. Indeed, the two are in dead sync. Good luck, Heidi. <laughs> Brown reaches in and starts the ignition. The DeLorean engine roars to life. Brown turns on the headlights and lowers the gullwing door, sealing Einstein in. He steps back and picks up a remote control unit, similar to one for a radio-controlled toy car. There are buttons labeled accelerator and brake, a joystick, and an LED digital readout labeled miles per hour. Brown flicks the power switch on and, using the accelerator button and joystick for steering, sends the DeLorean down to the far, far end of the parking lot. He turns the car around so that it's pointing toward them, idling. Here we go, Marty. If my calculations are correct, when the car hits 88 miles an hour, you're going to see some serious shit. I want to thank you, Sarah, and Christopher for my carrying that, me. I felt a little bit like an audition. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I didn't have to do one. Uh, we get, uh, I mean, a lot of aspiring writers always ask me, oh, how do you get an agent? And I've always said, if you write that, you don't have to worry. You will get an agent and you will get actors uh, to play it. When you read a part like that, Christopher, uh -huh. what, it, what is it when you read a great script like that or about the character, do you initially say, I have to do this, or there's a connection you can make when you read those kind of lines? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, I mean, it's, it's kind of what I, I tried to, I didn't see it instantly when I read the script, but um, try to find something that really I feel I'm, I could connect to and do in a way that the audience connects to the character, that I can communicate whatever the, you know, whatever the character is. And do you like having like the script where not telling you how to act, but giving you enough information about the character where you can say, this is what I can do to make it grow, or like getting a feel for the character um, then? <coughs> well, well, usually there's some kind of indication of, uh, uh, you know, about what the character is like. You know, maybe if it was just a, a sentence, he's uh, 44 and impatient or whatever, you know. And you kind of go with the clues that are given by what he, the character says. And, keep going over it, you know, I'll, I'll read a script over, over over again, trying to find just exactly what the character is, what, he's, what makes him tick, what he's about. And 
eventually, hopefully, I find that. Although sometimes I don't find it until the cameras start rolling. It's just uncertain. Um, like I just did something uh, these last couple of weeks, and the first couple of days I wasn't sure where my character was at, but I really think about it, and I try different things on different takes, and gradually something began to form, and I got an idea of the direction I wanted to go in. And, and it's collaborative, too, because um, we, we constantly rewrite the script um, for all different sorts of reasons. Sometimes because you run out of money and you can't afford to do something, or the weather changes or you get thrown out of a location, but sometimes you do, we start and, and we always do, uh, try to do a table reading and have everybody sit down and read through the script and get comfortable with the material. As a writer, sometimes uh, a line might, might look really good on paper, but when you hear somebody say it, it doesn't sound right at all. Uh, and so you, you sit there with the actors, um, the, the director does it, and you know, a lot of times the writer's in on it, which is always a good thing, <laughs> um, my, in my opinion. Uh, um, and, and, and the actors talk about what, the director's talking about this is what this scene is about, and the actors are saying, well, if, if this is what it's about, would he really do this, or would she really say that, or wouldn't it be better if this, and there's a lot of give and take in there, and after a, a table reading, there's always a, a big rewrite, because you say, oh, wait, we don't need half of that dialogue. It comes across really clear, or wow, that didn't make any sense at all, or we don't need that scene, or we need an extra scene here. All kinds of things can happen. So. Um, uh, on Back to the Future, I know, I remember Chris uh, talking to us about um, making Doc Brown sort of a combination of Albert Einstein and the uh, conductor Leopold Stokowski, who if you've seen Fantasia, you know what Leopold Stokowski looks like. <coughs> that's, the, that's the hair that, uh, that Doc Brown has. Mm -hmm. And the larger than life mannerisms of, of Leopold Stokowski uh, Chris being a big classical music buff, um, that was in his consciousness in incorporating some of that into the character. And as we got more comfortable with what Chris was going to do, it made it more and more, uh, it made it easier to, to figure out, okay, he would say this and not say that. Uh, the Pollock Theater is really likes to join, bring the students and community together. So I feel obligated to ask one question for the older members, you know, uh, the community. So, uh, so before the interwebs, there was a show called Taxi. Uh, <laughs> uh, so what was it like playing with like Judd Hirsch, Danny DeVito on a sitcom, kind of a live, almost with you know, a live feel to a more theatrical? I was amazed. Uh, I mean, I came when I came. From the, I was, grew up around New York City. And I, when I moved out here, I, I, had a res, I was resolved not to do a, a sitcom. And I told my agent that I did not want to do that because I didn't, I have to be frank, I didn't really respect them. You know, I thought, you know, I was a theater person and, and um, I, 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 I may be selling out to go to Hollywood, but I'm not going to sell that far out. <laughs> you know. So, but then my agent kind of eased, started easing scripts to me, and one of them was Taxi. And uh, I just, the character just, you know, was blatant <laughs> who the character was. And, and I went to uh, and saw, saw the company, and I thought, this is an incredible company of actors, a wonderful ensemble, amazing writers. Uh, a wonderful director, and I just thought, what's, what's the problem, you know? <laughs> so I, uh, I succumbed, <laughs> <laughs> and it was great. I mean, it was just a wonderful experience. So it sounds like good writing always is a good selling point for actors. Yeah, because, I mean, without it, what are you going to do, mumble? <laughs> 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 you know, you got it. You, you have to. And, hey, it. good actors can... Uh, can make uh, writers look really good, too. <laughs> yeah, well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, but that's why actors yeah. get the big bucks, really. <laughs> we, go, we go see people like people. People ask me, what's a, what are the three most important ingredients in a script? Character, character, and character. Um, you'll forgive a lot of sins uh, in, a, in a movie if you really like the characters. And we watch TV series because we like those characters. And some episodes are good and some maybe not so much. But if we love those characters, we keep coming back. And a great actor can uh, breathe so much life into, uh, into the written word that uh, that's why they get the big bucks. And we talked a little about like Night Stalker, classic show, which is really the X-Files totally ripped off. Uh, how was like your early career writing for television, and you know, and how did that come about? And <clears throat> well, when when uh, when Bob Zemeckis and I got started uh, out, of, out of USC Film School, uh, trying to figure out how we were going to break into the business, television wasn't really what we were that interested in. Um, Zemeckis was hanging around Universal Studios trying to figure out how he was going to get a job directing, and he was observing on the set of a TV series called McCloud. <coughs> starring Dennis Weaver. And uh, television in those days was, was done quite differently than it is today in terms of there were, there were only three networks and they would order an entire season of shows, um, not like today where they order three or four or six episodes at a time and see how the ratings are. Uh, a network would commit to an entire season of a TV show uh, and then wait till next year to decide whether they were going to renew it or not. So um, uh, Bob comes over to my apartment one night and he says, uh, Bob, I just found out they're down a script for McLeod. They, they, need, to, they need a script for McLeod in, uh, in two or three weeks and they don't have one. We got to write one. And I said, what's McLeod? <laughs> I had never even seen the show. So he'd swiped a few scripts from the production office and uh, I read them, and we banged out a two-hour McLeod script in about 10 days, uh, and they optioned it. And so we said, hey, this might be the way to break into television. Let's find out what shows need scripts. Um, we've, the, the Night Stalker was one. It was in the bottom of the ratings, and good writers don't want to write for shows that are in the bottom of the ratings because um, if it's going to get canceled or nobody's going to watch it, it's not going to get rerun. Every time a show gets rerun, you get more money. Um, so if you're a good writer, you want to write for the shows that are, that are the, in, the, in the ratings, top of the ratings. So we found out um, they needed material for The Night Stalker. They needed material for another series called uh, Get Christy Love, truly one of the worst television <laughs> shows ever, <laughs> ever conceived. Um, now, it was a cop show. It wasn't one of the worst shows ever conceived, but... Um, He's got me started, so I got to tell you the rest of the story here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a storyteller. I can't help it. I'm sorry. <clears throat> the um, actress in uh, Get Christy Love was a woman named Teresa Graves. And from when they picked up the pilot to when they started the series, she became a Jehovah's Witness. And she decided that uh, her character should not do anything that the Jehovah's Witnesses wouldn't approve of. <laughs> now, she's a police woman, right? <laughs> she's supposed to go undercover and pretend like she's a hooker. She's got to <laughs> lie to get the perps to do stuff. She wouldn't do any of that stuff. So writing scripts for this show was a total, total pain in the ass because you never. she had people from the church on the set ah. to tell her what <laughs> she could and couldn't do. Um, the show lasted for six episodes. Boom. It was gone. Bob and I uh, optioned to show that. The show never got made because it got canceled. Anyway, uh, after, uh, after selling three sh TV shows to Universal Television, uh, Universal offered us a seven-year contract to write television. This was in uh, 1975. Um, it would have meant that we would have each been making about $50,000 a year which was a whole lot of money. Uh, it's pretty good money today, but <laughs> back then it was a fortune. And we didn't want to write television. Um, we'd met television writers. Uh, they were kind of burned out. I mean, they just grinded it out, um, ground it out. Um, and it was um, 
we didn't want to become hacks, and it was an easy trap to fall into. We wanted to write features, so we turned this contract down. My father was convinced that he ra raised the stupidest kid <laughs> on the face of the earth for turning down a deal like that, but we did. But with the contract, when we were doing this without an agent, without, we were just doing this ourselves. Um, with the contract in our hands, before we turned it down, we knew we were gonna turn it down, we went knocking on doors and said, we got a seven year contract, would you sit down and talk to us? So we got, a, we got an agent that way and an attorney and got a little bit of respectability. <laughs> well, I would love to thank Bob Gale and Christopher Lloyd for joining us. Uh, You're welcome. Thank you so much. This is a, uh, if you, if you really, you really ought to thank our wonderful Poly Theater interns and students. They threw this together in two weeks. This yeah. whole entire event. Uh, so thank, you. thank you so much. And please enjoy the reception, the chairman on the sea reception. We have cookies and punch, and we'll be giving away some prizes for the best costumes, courtesy of Universal Studios. Back to the future DVA. And please, a shout out to Ron Ferguson, who brought in the DeLorean. Uh, thank you for that. That was a wonderful time. Thank you for all for coming.